Welcome to this week's GCN Techler. You know how it works by now. Send your questions in using the hashtag AskGCNTech and then we answer them and try to help you out as best as we can. First up, let's take a look at our first question in. It's from Rowan Colcade who asks, how much saddle tilt is allowed according to UCI rules and how do you measure it at home? So the UCI ruling says that you can have nine degrees of saddle tilt. That could be saddle tilt up or it could be saddle tilt down. And they allow for a margin of measuring error of one degree either way. So in theory, you could have 10 degrees down or 10 degrees up. This is opposed to the, the old rule, which has changed quite a few years ago now, which was only two and a half degrees. So now with that updated rule, you've got far more flexibility in trying to reach a position that's comfortable for you. And in terms of how to measure that at home, the easiest thing you can do, which most people have a smartphone, so you can get an app, many of them are free and some smartphones even have already built in, and you can just place that onto the saddle level and it will give you a measurement in degrees of the angle that the saddle sat. Pretty simple. And if you go to a UCI event and the, the judges or the UCI adjudicators have measured the saddle angle on your bike, they'll let you know if it's wrong straight away and you always do have the opportunity to adjust it and then get your bike retested. Perfect. On to our next question. It's from Shivanch Jaswal who asks, does the weight of your bike matter on a home trainer? Um, in terms of safety, I don't think it really matters. Obviously, your bike is going to have a weight limit on it, as well as the smart trainer itself. And I actually looked up, and the, the weight limit on a Wahoo Kicker, for example, is up at around 113 kilograms. So, fairly comparable with the weight limit of almost all modern bikes. So, it's something that you maybe need to be mindful of, particularly if you've got a heavy bike or you're a slightly heavier rider like myself as well. Um, so, just be mindful of it. But the main thing is, just double check the weight limit of your frame first because it's likely that that might be slightly less of the weight limit of your indoor trainer. And in terms of if the weight matters when you're on, um, if you're thinking of an in-game experience such as Zwift for example, then the weight of your bike bears no resemblance whatsoever because you choose your bike within the game. All you need to do is input the rider weight and the game will work it out and calibrate everything so that you ride at the correct speed when going uphill. On to our next question, which is from M16 MB02. Very catchy username, thanks for that. Who asks, when tackling 30 to 60 second KOMs when out on the road, would you rather sprint out of the saddle on a road bike or go full tuck on a TT bike? Aero is the key, right? Well, this is gonna vary a lot depending on the sort of segment you're trying to target, whether it's you know, a particularly fast segment, the gradient of it, and even the road that it's on the surface, as well as where it's twisty or a straight main road, for example. But personally, the first thing I'd be concerned about is trying to be safe when I'm doing this. Obviously, we all wanna have fun, we all wanna ride our bikes fast, but make sure you're safe. If that segment I'm trying to target is particularly fast, so, you know, maybe 30, 40 kilometers an hour, then yeah, aero is gonna be the main thing you need to focus on. So you'd wanna be tucked in and as aerodynamic as possible. But if you're going uphill, or you're going at a slow speed, for example, then it's all about having control over the bike and efficient power delivery. So find a balance of what is the, the KOM segment that you're searching for, and then balance up how you need to ride it. So if it's fast, focus on air. If it's a bit slower, focus on your control and your power delivery. Well, and hopefully, you'll pick up that comm you've been chasing. On to our next question, which is from Ron Gattenby, who asks, Controversy, strip the factory grease off a new chain. Alex says, yeah, yeah, you're right. I did say strip the factory grease off. And he's pretty sure in a previous video, Ollie says no, and he says, duke it out. Well, I can tell you now, it's gonna take far more than that to create a divide between me and Ollie. We need far more controversial topics as to whether you should leave the factory grease on your chain. But personally, I stick with what I say, take the factory grease off your chain. It, as far as I'm concerned, it acts as a sort of super magnet to grit and grime stick into your chain and it'll wear it out far quicker than it otherwise would. So there you have it. You won't ever see me riding a bike with that factory grease on it, but you know, everyone's free for their own opinion and take your own choice in what you do. Next question is from Florian Posh. Do headwinds affect lighter riders more than heavier ones? 
So he's saying, assuming that the surface exposed to the wind is comparable. His thought is, power, which correlates to muscle mass, is relative to weight, but opposing wind force isn't. Um, oh, there's a lot of information missing from uh, that question. There's far too many variations and different factors to consider into that equation. So let's sort of summarize it a little bit, I guess. So we've got two riders, exactly the same CDA, the same riding position, the same frontal area, the same equipment. We've got two people like for like, it just so happens that one person's body is uh, incredibly dense and very heavy. Are they gonna be affected more by the wind than the other rider? Well, once they're going along at the same speed, there's gonna be absolutely no difference whatsoever, providing they're on level ground. As soon as you introduce a gradient, then of course the heavy rider is gonna slow down. But one thing I do wanna point out is that in terms of gusts of wind, for example, the heavier rider is gonna be less affected than the lighter rider. Um, and that's because of the momentum that they have and that inertia that they've built up whilst being heavier. I know they've got the same frontal area, they've got the same CDA, they've got the same drag coefficients, call it however you like, but for a down to earth simple example, imagine having two footballs hanging from a string. One of them is filled with air, one of them's filled with water or concrete, so one is incredibly heavy. Now, in a strong gust of wind, the football that's full of air is gonna blow around and move far more than the heavy football, which is full of water. So take that same principle and apply it to your bike riders, and then you'll see that the heavier rider will be less affected by the wind. On to our next question from Jerome Jalarina, who says, I've seen flat aerodynamic looking carbon handlebars. Do they really help and make you more aerodynamic. Um, well, the actual shape of the handlebar itself is gonna have minimal impact on the aerodynamics of your bike. Yes, fancy aero-shaped handlebars are gonna be faster than the traditional sort of round tube-shaped handlebars, but that's quite a small difference. We're talking in the realms of a handful of watts, maybe five to six watts at best if you compared a particularly slow handlebar to a fast handlebar. But what is crucial when it comes to choosing your handlebars is the riding position that allows you and your body to adopt on your bike. Because after all, your body position is, well it does have the most impact on your riding speed than any component of your bike. So make sure you get your body position dialed in first because that's the most important part. And then once you're happy, you've got your body position optimized, then you can look to move into an aerodynamically optimized handlebar shape because that's one of the smaller or last pieces in the puzzle. Get your body position sorted, then pick out your fancy handlebars. So our next question is from Matthew Rendell, who asks, Hi, I've been looking at power meters which reside in the crank. And my question is, how do they work? How do they measure the power you're generating? And is the technology that you use to measure that the reason why they are as expensive as they are? Thanks, Matt. Um, well, there's a few tricky questions in there. Your power meter has what's known as a strain gauge on it. You might have a dual sided power meter, so have one on the left and one on the right. But ultimately, that strain gauge is very, very accurately and carefully measuring the deflection or the sort of the change in the, in the properties of the material in your crank arms. So it's basically measuring the flexion and in simple terms, it's measuring how much movement or bend is in your crank when you apply force to it. So that's measuring the force, and then we need to know torque. So torque is calculated by taking that force that your strain gauge is measured and multiplying it by the length of your crank. Now that's obviously a set measurement for whatever crank you've got, and your crank and power meter will know that. So then it's able to calculate the torque. Once your power meter has a torque reading, it then can calculate how fast it's rotating, so that's your cadence. So it can calculate that next, so you've got your torque, you've got your cadence, and then there's a simple equation where you take those two figures and that'll calculate your power. And that's what all power meters do to give you a power reading. And do you know what? They're doing that multiple times over and over again, every second, far quicker than any human could ever calculate that. And that's why they're actually quite impressive and expensive bits of kit. On to our last question for this week's Tech Clinic, which is from David Kempsell, who asks, 
What goes faster on a flat time trial course? A top of the range road bike or a cheap bike with clip on aero bars? God, we've had quite a few aero questions this week. God, Ollie would have loved this week's tech clue. Um, so what's faster? Top of the range road bike or a cheap bike with aero clip on bars. So as I've spoken about already in this week's tech clinic, your body position accounts for the majority of the drag or the resistance that you're fighting against when you're trying to ride fast. So it's a fairly simple answer here. The time trial, the road bike with clip on aero bars is gonna get your body into a far greater aerodynamic position than what you could adopt on a traditional road bike. So that is gonna be the fastest option. I know it seems crazy to say that a super top end road bike isn't going to be as fast as a cheap one, but you're not comparing like for like. If we remove those clip on handlebars, then obviously the top end road bike is going to be faster. But again, there's lots of variations to this question. You could be riding a cheap bike that still has really good aerodynamic properties to it, or you could be riding a super expensive top end bike that's got no focus on aerodynamics. It could be all about absolute lightweight. So. It is a very broad question that you've got there, but in essence, your body position is the most important thing to helping you ride faster. And then you can start to look at your equipment and your bike, because that'll be one of the later pieces in the puzzle to try and help you ride faster. That's unfortunately it for this week's GCN Tech Link. I hope you've enjoyed it. It's been a bit of an aero special this week. Oh, Ollie would have loved it. As always, keep those questions coming in the comment section down below using hashtag AskGCNTech. And as always, again, well, I'll see you next week. Bye.